chapter one of the rover boys on land and sea by arthur m winfield this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard the rover boys on land and sea by arthur m winfield chapter one the rover boys in san francisco well dick here we are in san francisco at last yes tom and what a fine large city it is we'll have to take care or we'll get lost came from a third boy the youngest of the party just listen to sam cried tom rover get lost as if we weren't in the habit of taking care of ourselves sam is joking came from dick rover still we might get lost here as well as in new york or any other large city boston is the place to get lost in said tom rover got streets that curve in all directions but let us go on where is the hotel i'm sure i don't know came from sam rover cab carriage coupe bawled a cabman standing near take you anywhere you want to go gents how much to take the three of us to the oakland house take you there for a dollar trunks and all i'll go you answered dick rover come on i'll see that you get the right trunks i think we are going to have some good times while we are on the pacific coast observed tom rover while he and sam are waiting for dick and the cabman to return i shan't object to a good time replied sam that is what we came for before we go back i am going to have a sail up and down the coast to be sure tom perhaps we can sail down to santa barbara that is a sort of asbury park and coney island combined so i have been told dick rover and the cabman soon returned the trunks were piled on the carriage and the boys got in and away they bowled from the station in the direction of the oakland house it was about ten o'clock of a clear day in early spring the boys had reached san francisco a few minutes before taking in the sights on the way now they sat up in the carriage taking in more sights as the turnout moved along first one street and then another as old readers of the series know the rover boys were three in number dick being the oldest fun-loving tom next and sturdy-hearted sam the youngest they were the only offspring of anderson rover a former traveller and mine owner who at present was living with his brother randolph and his sister-in-law martha on their beautiful farm at valleybrook in the heart of new york state during the past few years the rover boys had had numerous adventures so many in fact that they can scarcely be hinted at here while their father was in the heart of africa their uncle randolph had sent them off to putnam hall academy here they had made many friends among the boys and also among some folks living in the vicinity including mrs stanhope and her daughter dora a girl who according to dick rover's idea was the sweetest creature in the whole world they had also made some enemies the worst of the number being dan baxter a fellow who had been the bully of the school but who was now a homeless wanderer on the face of the earth baxter came from a disreputable family his father having at one time tried to swindle mr rover out of a rich gold mine in the west the elder baxter was now in prison suffering the penalty for various crimes a term at school had been followed by an exciting chase on the ocean and then by a trip through the jungle of africa whence the rover boys had gone to find their long-lost father after this the boys made a trip west to establish their parents claim to the gold mine just mentioned and this was followed by a grand trip on the great lakes in which the boys suffered not a little at the hands of the baxters on an island on one of the lakes the rover boys found a curious casket and this on being opened proved to contain some directions for locating a treasure secreted in the heart of the adirondack mountains we must locate that treasure said tom rover and off they started for the mountains and did locate it at last 
but not before dan baxter had done everything in his power to locate it ahead of them when they finally outwitted their enemy dan baxter had disappeared and that was the last they had seen of him for some time the rover boys had expected to return to putnam hall and their studies immediately after the winter outing in the adirondacks but an unexpected happening at the institution of learning made them change their plans three pupils were taken down with scarlet fever and rather than run the risk of having more taken sick captain victor putnam had closed up the academy for the time being and sent the pupils to their homes the boys will have to go to some other school their aunt martha had said but one and another had murmured at this for they loved captain putnam too well to desert him so quickly let us wait a few months had been dick's suggestion let us study at home had come from sam let us travel tom had put in travel broadens the mind he loved to be on the go all the time the matter was talked over for several days and tom begged that they might take a trip across the continent and back using some of the money derived from the old treasure at last anderson rover consented and two days later the three boys were off going by way of new york city on the chicago limited they had spent two days in the great city by the lakes and then come direct to the golden gate city i wonder if we will meet anybody we know while we are out here said tom as the carriage continued on its way if we get down to santa barbara i think we'll meet somebody answered dick and he blushed just a trifle i got a letter in chicago as you know it was from dora stanhope and she said that she and her mother were traveling again and expected to go either to santa barbara or los angeles her mother is not well again and the doctor thought the air on the pacific coast might benefit her oh my but won't dick have an elegant time if he falls in with dora cried sam tom we won't be in it now don't you start to tease me returned dick his face redder than ever i guess dora always gave you a good time too that's right she did said tom and then he added did she say anything about the lanings for the laning girls nellie and grace were cousins to dora stanhope and tom and sam thought almost as much of them as dick did of dora to be sure she did replied dick but i guess it's well it's a secret a secret shouted sam not much dick let us in on it at once yes do put in tom but it may prove a disappointment we'll chance it returned tom well then dora wrote that if she and her mother could find a nice cottage at los angeles or santa barbara they were going to invite nellie and grace to come out and keep house with them for six months or so hurrah cried sam enthusiastically i hope they come if they do won't the six of us just have boss times and his face glowed with anticipation we can certainly have good times if mrs stanhope's health will permit said dick here we are at the hotel he uttered the last words as the carriage came to a stop at the curb he leapt out and so did the others and a few minutes later found them safe and sound in the hotel they were assigned to a large room on the third floor and hither they made their way followed by their trunks and then began to wash and dress up preparatory to going down to the dining room for the journeying around since breakfast had made them hungry i think i am going to like san francisco said tom as he was adjusting a fresh collar and gazing out of the window at the same time everything looks so bright and clean they have some pretty tall buildings here the same as in chicago and new york came from dick as he too gazed out of the window oh all the big cities are a good deal alike put in sam who was drying his face on a towel san francisco is a mighty rich place continued tom they are too rich even to use pennies it's five cents here or a bit there or two bits for this and two bits for that i never heard a quarter called two bits in new york i've been told that is a southern expression and one used in the west indies said dick the early californians my gracious dick broke off short and leaned far out of the window 
which they had opened to let in the fresh spring air what's up queried tom don't fall out and he caught his elder brother by the arm i must have been mistaken but it did look like him said dick slowly look like whom asked sam joining the pair dan baxter dan baxter here shouted the others i am pretty sure it was dan baxter where is he asked tom he is gone now he just disappeared around the hotel corner well if it really was dan baxter we want to keep our eyes open was sam's comment End of chapter one chapter two of the rover boys on land and sea by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter two the turning up of dan baxter the boys were very curious concerning their old enemy and on going below took a walk around several squares in the vicinity in the hope of meeting the individual who had attracted dick's attention but the search proved unsuccessful and they returned to the hotel and went to dinner with a larger appetite than ever it would be queer if we met dan baxter out here said tom while they were eating he seems to get on our heels no matter where we go if he came to san francisco first he'll think we have been following him up said sam he must have come here before we did said dick our arrival dates back but three hours and he grinned the meal over the boys took it easy for a couple of hours and then prepared to go out and visit half a dozen points of interest and also purchase tickets for a performance at one of the leading theatres in the evening as they crossed the lobby of the hotel they almost ran into a big burly young fellow who was coming in the opposite direction dan baxter ejaculated dick then i was right after all the burly young fellow stared first at dick and then the others in blank amazement he carried a dress suit case and this dropped from his hand to the floor what where did you come from he stammered at last i guess we can ask the same question said tom coldly been following me have you sneered dan baxter making an effort to recover his self-possession no we haven't been following you said sam supposing you tell us how it happens that you are here suppose you tell us came from dick that is my business our business is our own too dan baxter you followed me growled the big bully his face darkening i know you and don't you forget it why should we follow you said tom we got the best of you over that treasure in the adirondacks oh you needn't blow remember the old saying he laughs best who laughs last i ain't done with you yet not by a long shot well let me warn you to keep your distance said dick sternly if you don't you'll regret it we have been very easy with you in the past but if you go too far i for one will be putting you where your father is in prison and i say the same said tom ditto here came from sam at these words a look of bitter hatred crossed dan baxter's face he clenched his fists and breathed hard you can brag when you are three to one he cried fiercely but wait that's all my father would be a free man if it wasn't for you wait and see what i do and so speaking he caught up his dress suit case swung around on his heel and left the hotel before anybody could stop him he's the same old baxter said tom with a long sigh always going to square up i think he is more vindictive than he used to be observed sam when dick spoke about his father being in prison he looked as if he would like to strangle the lot of us well i admit it would be rough on any ordinary boy to mention the fact that his father was in prison said dick but we all know and dan baxter himself knows that one is about as wicked as the other the only thing that makes 
arnold baxter's case worse is that he is old enough to know better so is dan old enough to know better was tom's comment i believe he was coming here to get accommodations said dick if he was that would tend to prove that he had just arrived in san francisco dick true but he may have been in this vicinity perhaps in oakland alameda or some other nearby town what do you suppose could have brought him here that's a conundrum maybe he thought the east was getting too hot to hold him i wish we knew where he was going let us see if we can follow him up but to follow dan baxter up was out of the question as they speedily discovered when they stepped out on the sidewalk people were hurrying in all directions and the bully had been completely swallowed up in the crowd we must watch out said dick now he knows we are here he will try to do us harm mark my words the wall that afternoon proved full of interest and in the evening they went to see a performance of a light opera at the columbia theatre the performance gave them a good deal of pleasure quarter past eleven exclaimed dick when they were coming away that's the time we've got our money's worth i thought it must be late said tom i was getting hungry let us get a bite of something before we go back to the hotel the others were willing and they entered a nearby restaurant and seated themselves at one of the tables as they did this a person who had been following them stopped at the door to peer in after them the person was dan baxter they are going to dine before retiring he muttered to himself the old nick take the luck they have all the good times while i have only the bad dan baxter had followed the boys from the hotel to the theatre and had also waited around with them to come out he wanted to square up with them but had no definite plan of action and was trusting to luck for something to turn up in his favour he had drifted to the west for a double reason the one was as the boys had surmised because the east seemed to be getting too hot to hold him his second reason was that he hoped to get passage on some vessel bound for sydney australia he had a distant relative in australia and thought that if he could only see that relative personally he might be able to get some money he was nearly out of funds and so far the relative although rich had refused to send any money by mail or express they have everything they want while i have nothing he went on savagely and they don't deserve it either oh how i wish i could wring their necks for em suddenly an idea struck him and without waiting for the boys to come out of the restaurant he hopped on board of a street car running in the direction of the oakland house entering the hotel office he asked to look at the register room three twenty four he said to himself that is on the third floor i suppose since they generally start a new hundred for every floor wonder if i can get up without being noticed he watched his chance and slipping past the bellboys made his way up the stairs which on account of the elevators were but little used in a few minutes he was in front of the door to room three twenty four he tried it cautiously to find it locked now if only the keys will work he muttered breathing hard and taking a bunch of keys from his pocket he tried them one after another he had tried four keys without success when he saw a waiter approaching with a trayful of good things for a late supper in a nearby apartment at once he moved away down the hallway and did not return until the servant had disappeared from view he had five other keys and the third fitted the lock although rather crudely so crudely in fact that once the lock bolt was turned the key could not be withdrawn that's bad he thought but as it cannot be helped i'll have to make the best of it i mustn't stay here too long and going into the room he closed the door after him there was a faint light burning at one of the gas jets and this he turned up and pulled down the shades of the windows then he gazed swiftly around the large room noting the boys trunks and travelling bags and several articles of wearing apparel scattered about oh if only i can find what i am after he muttered but more than likely they carry their money with them or else they left it at the hotel office all of the trunks and travelling bags were locked 
and to force the trunks open seemed at first impossible one of the travelling bags was slit open with a sharp pocket knife the bully carried and the contents emptied on one of the beds not much that i want muttered dan baxter as he gazed at the collection then a jewel case caught his eye and he opened it a diamond stud and a diamond scarf pin not so bad after all and he transferred the jewelry to his pocket a second later he came upon a bunch of keys they proved to belong to the trunks and bags and soon he had the trunks open and the contents scattered in all directions then he went down on his knees examining everything brought to light it must be confessed that he was in a fever of excitement the rover boys might return at any moment and he knew full well that to be caught would mean a term in prison he kept his ears on the alert while his heart thumped loudly within his bosom a pocket-book at last he cried softly and snatched it up one look showed him a small pile of five and ten dollar bills exactly two hundred and seventy five dollars in all then he found another jewel case and from it extracted a second diamond stud and a pair of very fine cuff buttons that is all i guess i can get he muttered as he stood up but i might as well take a new outfit while i am at it he added and picked up several articles of wearing apparel these he stuffed in one of the bags which had not been cut and around it put a small strap tiptoeing his way to the door he opened it and listened nobody was within hearing or sight but as he stepped out the waiter he had before seen came once more into view this time carrying a tray with some bottles and a box of cigars the waiter eyed him curiously again but said nothing too bad he saw me but it can't be helped thought dan baxter and made his way downstairs with all possible speed once in the lower hall he lost no time in gaining the street in another moment he was swallowed up in the darkness of the night End of chapter two chapter three of the rover boys on land and sea by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter three a discovery and what followed hello what does this mean here is a key in the door it was dick rover who spoke he stood in the hallway of the hotel and beside him were tom and sam they had eaten rather heartily at the restaurant and taken more time than they had anticipated i didn't leave the key there came from tom here it is and he brought it out of his pocket i meant to leave it at the desk but it slipped my mind dick found the door open and walked into the room followed by his brothers baxter had extinguished the gas and they stood in the dark until sam found a match and lit up then a cry went up from all three we have been robbed this is some sneak thief's work came from dick run down and tell the hotel clerk at once tom bolted from the room and went down the stairs three steps at a time the clerk sat dozing in his chair and was roused up with difficulty but as soon as he realized that something was wrong he was wide awake a robbery eh he queried what have you lost we've got to find that out answered tom in less than a quarter of an hour they knew the extent of their loss three diamonds and a pair of cuff buttons in all worth over two hundred dollars and two hundred and seventy five dollars in cash not to mention a ruined valise and one missing and the loss of a light overcoat some silk handkerchiefs and some underwear a total loss of over five hundred dollars at this the hotel clerk gave a long whistle as much as that yes said dick we must get on the track of the thief and without delay i reckon i know the thief said sam you think it was dan baxter questioned his elder brother i do perhaps you are right but there is no proof that he did it the hotel clerk found the windows closed and locked the thief came in and went out by the door he said the hall boys or somebody else must have seen him this key is stuck in the lock which proves that it is not a regular hotel key 
without delay the story of the robbery was telephoned to the nearest police station and soon two detectives appeared by this time some of the servants noticed that something was wrong and the waiter who had seen dan baxter come in and go out told his story to which the boys the hotel clerk and the detectives listened with interest tell us just how that fellow looked said dick and the waiter gave a very good description of the person he had seen i imagine sam is right said dick if it wasn't dan baxter it was his double upon hearing this the hotel clerk and the detectives insisted upon knowing who dan baxter was and the boys told as much of the bully as they deemed necessary of course if he is guilty the chances are that he will leave san francisco as soon as possible said one of the detectives the best we can do is to try to head him off and we'll do our best to find him too added tom i think the hotel ought to be responsible for this robbery said dick you didn't leave your key at the desk when you went out cried the hotel clerk struck by a sudden idea what of that asked tom that makes the guest responsible what cried tom aghast we are responsible only when the key is left at the desk and jewels must be left for keeping in one of our safes went on the clerk there are our rules and he pointed to the printed form tacked on the inside of the door don't let us talk about that just now said one of the detectives i think we can get hold of this thief and if we are quick about it we'll get everything he took too the matter was talked over for a quarter of an hour longer and then the detectives went off to make their report and to follow on the trail of dan baxter if such a thing was possible it must be confessed that the three rover boys slept but little that night the loss of the cash was something of a serious matter to them even though they still possessed a hundred odd dollars in cash between them and could easily telegraph home for more more than this the diamonds and cuff buttons had been gifts of which they were very proud and to think that dan baxter should get them said tom i wouldn't feel half so bitter if it had been just some ordinary sneak thief and the others said the same two days went by and nothing was learned concerning dan baxter further than he had put up at the montgomery hotel for one night and had left early in the morning he is hundreds of miles away from here by this time said dick sadly he said he would get square and i guess he has done it returned tom but dan baxter had not gotten as far as they supposed he was in hiding in oakland across the bay having pawned the diamonds at a pawnbroker's of shady reputation for seventy five dollars this gave him three hundred and fifty dollars in cash which made him for the time being feel quite rich but he was afraid to take a train to some other town and so remained in the boarding-house for nearly a week under the assumed name of robert brown at the end of the fifth day dan baxter became acquainted with a seafaring man named jack lesher lesher was a rough fellow who had sailed to many ports on the pacific ocean he had now obtained the position of first mate on a large schooner which was to sail in a few days from san francisco to several ports in australia i'd like to go on that trip to australia said baxter thinking of his distant relative do you want a passenger i'll see about it my hearty replied jack lesher and on the following day said that captain blossom would take him for an even hundred dollars a bargain was struck at once and dan baxter went on board of the schooner golden wave that afternoon i'm glad i am out of it he told himself when snug on board of the craft i'll get to australia after all and i'm considerably richer than i thought i would be more than that i've got in on those rover boys in a way they won't forget in a hurry while the detectives looked for the thief the boys had small heart to go sightseeing every time they went out they looked for dan baxter if only i could meet him cried tom oh but wouldn't i just punch him good before i passed him over to a policeman during those days the lads received several letters from home and also three communications from the stanhopes and the rainings the stanhopes have gone to santa barbara announced 
dick after perusing an epistle from dora and she says her mother is slightly better nelly laning is coming out and so is grace said tom when questioned dick they have already started according to the letter i have put in sam boys i think we can have just the jolliest time ever was when the girls are all together right you are came from tom what a pity we had to have that robbery to darken our fun i am not going to let it darken my fun said dick don't worry but what some day we'll get the best of dan baxter that stolen stuff will never do him much good the very next morning came word from the detectives one of them called at the hotel i am afraid the case is queered said he we tracked the rascal to oakland and now it looks as if he had given us the slip for good can't you find any trace of him questioned sam oh yes but he has shipped on a vessel which is bound for australia and as she is already two days out of port he is out of our reach you are certain he went on that vessel cried tom yes he went as a passenger under the name of robert brown and did he take the jewels and money with him more than likely at any rate we can find no trace of the jewels then that chase is done for said dick and we shall have to pocket our loss the detective was chagrined to think that he had tracked dan baxter only to lose him and promised to see if anything more could be done in the matter but nothing could be done as there was no telling when the golden wave would arrive in australia and what port the craft would first make we have seen the last of dan baxter said sam but the youngest rover was mistaken they were to meet the bully again and under circumstances as astonishing as they were perilous End of chapter three chapter four of the rover boys on land and sea by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter four good times at santa barbara what a land of plenty it was tom who made the remark the rover boys were on their way to santa barbara after having spent three weeks at san francisco and vicinity they had received word that dora stanhope and her mother and the two laning girls were at the fashionable watering place and they were anxious to meet their old friends on sped the luxurious train over hills and through valleys past heavy woodlands and by rich fruit farms it was a scene which interested them greatly and they never tired of sitting at the windows gazing out presently the car door opened and a tall young fellow carrying a valise stepped inside and walked down the aisle as he came closer dick rover leapt up bob sutter he cried with a smile of pleasure who would ever dream of meeting you out here is it really dick rover questioned the newcomer as he shook hands and tom and sam too i must be dreaming is putnam hall on its travels we are on our travels replied tom also shaking hands followed by sam but what are you doing here bob sutter a former scholar at putnam hall smiled broadly i live in california now my father is interested in real estate in los angeles ventura and santa barbara our home is in santa barbara that is where we are going came from sam what are you doing just traveling around yes we thought we'd put in time until the hall opens again i heard it had been closed too bad if you are going to santa barbara you must call and see me by all means went on bob sutter to be sure we will said tom and his brothers nodded we were going down there now to call on the stanhopes said dick they have come here for the benefit of mrs stanhope's health and nellie and grace laning are with them i guess you know them all i know the laning girls and i think i did meet miss stanhope once at a football game i'll be glad to meet them again but tell me about yourselves bob sutter sat down and soon all were talking at a lively rate the newcomer was astonished to hear of the doings of dan baxter the baxters always were a hard crowd he said i hope you'll get back your stuff some time it was late at night when santa barbara was reached yet many of the hotels were ablaze of light from top to bottom 
at the depot the rover boys parted with bob sutter but promised to call upon him in a day or two i've got a fine yacht said bob sutter sometime i want to take you for a trip just what we were wishing for cried tom just name your time that's all how will next monday suit will your yacht hold us asked sam the old glory will hold ten passengers on a pinch answered bob sutter then you don't sail the craft alone i can sail her in fair weather but father makes me take an old sailor named jerry tolman along with me jerry is a character a regular old salt and i love to have his company and that makes me think why can't we make up a party and go out you can bring the three girls you are going to visit and i can bring my cousin mary parlow now you are talking shouted sam what a jolly trip it will be the proposal met with immediate approval and it was decided that the boys should meet not later than saturday afternoon to complete arrangements the rover boys had received word that mrs stanhope had rented a furnished cottage not far from one of the leading hotels the lady was very nervous and did not like too much noise and confusion about her meals were brought in from the hotel which made it very pleasant when the three boys drove up in a carriage from the depot three girls came rushing out to greet them the three were dora stanhope and her two cousins nelly and grace laning so here you are at last cried dora stanhope as she gave dick's hand a tight squeeze we almost made up our mind you had missed the train said nelly laning to tom giving him a bright smile as she spoke how fine you are looking said grace to sam traveling must agree with you traveling does agree with us said sam we would have been here sooner only we stopped to talk to an old schoolmate said dick and then he told about bob sutter oh i remember bob sutter said nelly we went on a straw ride together once before you came to putnam hall she added to tom i know him too put in grace he's a nice boy of course he is said sam pointedly but he isn't as nice as some boys went on grace in a lower tone and giving sam an arch smile that made him feel very happy they were soon in the cottage and greeting mrs stanhope who had been lying on a couch the lady greeted them in a motherly way that made them feel more at home than ever she thought a great deal of the rover boys and especially of dick and did not object in the least to the marked attention dick bestowed upon her only child as my old readers know the rover boys had in the past done mother and daughter more than one valuable service the boys were fortunate in obtaining rooms in the hotel close to the cottage which would make it possible for them to run in and out as they pleased it's like old times to be together again said tom when he and his brothers were retiring that night and as mrs stanhope is feeling so well i guess we can have lots of fun and fun they did have there were bathing in the surf and lawn tennis and dancing at the hotel in the evening and also lovely walks and drives and once they went out on horseback to a large fruit farm some miles away and were royally entertained by some of bob sutter's friends bob sutter and his cousin mary parlow went along and proved first-class company the idea of a trip on bob's yacht suited everybody and it was decided that the whole party should go out early monday morning taking old jerry tolman with them they were to load down well with provisions and visit not only several points along the coast but also one or two of the islands lying twenty-five to thirty miles south of santa barbara the rover boys had already inspected the old glory and found her to be a first-class yacht in every respect the craft was about sixty feet in length and correspondingly broad of beam she carried a tall mast but the lead in her keel was amply sufficient to keep her from going over unless under full sail in a very heavy wind the cabin was fairly large and richly furnished for the sutters were a family of means and desired everything of the best if the boys liked the yacht they also liked the man who had charge of her bluff and hardy jerry tolman captain jerry as bob sutter called him he was truly an old salt having sailed the ocean since his tenth year on both whalers and merchantmen 
Captain Jerry lacked a book education, but he was naturally shrewd, and far from being a fool. Downright glad to meet ye, me hearties, he said, when the boys were brought on board, and he gave each hand a grip like that of iron. Want to look over my lady, eh? Well, she's a putty one to inspect. Take my word on it and he showed them over the craft with pleasure. They found the yacht clean as a whistle, and each particular bit of brasswork polished like a mirror. By Saturday evening all was ready for the trip. On Sunday morning the Rover boys went to church with the Stanhopes and the Lanings, and rested in the afternoon. They were just about to go to supper when a note came for Dick. It was from Bob Sutter, and ran as follows. My dear Dick, my cousin and I have been in an accident. We went driving to church this morning, and the horse ran away and threw us both out on the rocks. Miss Parlow had her collarbone broken, and I broke my left ankle. Kindly come and see me, if you can. An accident, cried Tom. That is too bad. Let us all go and see him, suggested Sam, and this plan was carried out. They found that Bob Sutter was resting easily on his bed. The doctor had set the broken ankle and put it in plaster, and he had told Bob that he must keep quiet for several weeks. This ends that yacht trip, so far as I am concerned, said Bob ruefully. Never mind, we can wait until you get well, said Dick cheerfully. Although he did not expect to remain at Santa Barbara more than ten days longer. No, I don't want you to wait, answered Bob Sutter. My cousin won't be well, so they tell me, for several months and I won't want to go without her. I've been thinking that you had better take the trip without us. Captain Jerry can easily run the yacht with your aid. That's very kind of you, said Tom, but we'd rather have you along. The matter was talked over for an hour. The Rover boys knew that Dora, Nellie, and Grace would be sorely disappointed if the yacht trip was given up. At last they decided to accept Bob Sutter's kind suggestion and made the trip without the company of the young owner and his cousin, and then they withdrew, wishing Bob a speedy recovery. End of chapter 4《Chapter 5. On Board of the Yacht What a glorious day for the trip! We are going to turn real sailors, aren't we? Can't I help pull up a sail or something, Tom? Such were the remarks of Dora, Nellie, and Grace as they boarded the Old Glory early on Monday morning. The boys and Captain Jerry were there to receive them, having arrived an hour before, to see that all the provisions were stowed away, and that the craft was in prime condition for sailing. By a curious combination of circumstances, Bob Sutter had ordered far more provisions than were necessary for such a short trip, but Captain Jerry had found a place for everything, remarking that they might come in useful after all, but never dreaming how useful, as later events were to prove. Mrs. Stanhope had come down in a carriage to see them off. She kissed all of the girls an affectionate goodbye. "'Have a good time,' she said, "'and be sure and come back, safe and sound.' don't you worry but what i'll bring em back safe enough ma'am said captain jerry as he tipped his cap respectfully when the girls were safe on board the boys waved an adieu to mrs stanhope then they ranged up in a row in front of old jerry and each touched his forelock and gave a hitch to his trouser leg ready for orders cap'n they said in unison having practiced this little by play in secret what stammered captain jerry gazing at them in bewilderment ready for orders sir they said shall we shake out the mainsail asked dick shall i hoist the jib came from tom can i set the topsail captain put in sam well by the son of neptune gasped captain jerry got a real genuine crew ain't i all right my hearties i'll set you to work fast enough and then followed a string of orders in true nautical style, and the Rover boys flew in one direction and another to execute them. Up went the mainsail and the jib, and the topsail followed, and soon the old glory was standing off into Santa Barbara Channel, with Mrs. Stanhope in the carriage waving them an adieu 
and the girls and the boys waving their handkerchiefs in return it certainly was a glorious day as dora had said and after the sails were set there was nothing to do but to take it easy on the cushions of the rail seats captain jerry was at the wheel but he promised to let each of them take a trick in his place before the trip should come to an end i just wish we had another yacht to race with said the old sailor then i could show ye what sort of a clean pair of heels the old glory could show the other craft it is easy to see the yacht is speedy replied dick she cuts the water like a thing of life and you know just how to get her best speed out of her he went on a remark that pleased old jerry very much will we have more breeze do you think asked tom later on as he observed some in clouds to the westward can't say as to that lad those clouds may come this way and they may blow northward if they come down here we'll catch it putty lively i like a good stiff breeze came from sam oh don't run us into a storm cried grace in alarm we might all get seasick don't be alarmed said dick we are a very long way from a storm to my way of thinking the morning passed quickly enough and at noon they ran into a small harbor on one of the islands and had dinner in true picnic style at one o'clock they packed up once more went on board of the old glory and stood off to the westward for all wanted a run right on the ocean as tom expressed it captain jerry was just a bit doubtful of the trip for the clouds in the western sky had grown considerably larger than when first noticed not that he did not think the yacht could weather a blow but he was afraid the young ladies would get seasick however as he did not wish to put a damper on their fun he said nothing resolved to turn back at the first sign of any inward upsetting as he expressed it the breeze had increased and as it was directly from offshore the old glory bowled along merrily over the waves nobody showed the least sign of seasickness and they talked laughed and sang as if they had not a care in the world tom also did some fishing and caught a string of the finny tribe of which he was justly proud you can bake them for us when we get back he said to nelly and then we can all have a fish party i could go on sailing like this for a week said dick to dora as they moved forward i mean if you were along with me he added in a lower tone and she gave him a look that meant a good deal when three o'clock came captain jerry announced that they must turn back they were far out of sight of land with nothing but the blue ocean around them overhead the sky was still clear but the clouds on the horizon were rapidly increasing oh let us keep on a while longer pleaded tom this is just glorious and the others said the same so they kept on although somewhat against captain jerry's better judgment the old sailor was watching the clouds presently there came an extra heavy puff of wind and then the clouds seemed to rush up with lightning-like rapidity got to go back now said the sailor going to have a big blow afore night and he threw over the tiller and gave the necessary commands to change the sails by jove but those clouds are coming up fast exclaimed dick after a careful survey i ever saw them come up like that on the atlantic or on the great lakes it's unusual replied captain jerry with a shake of his head never seen it afore myself the wind is coming around too it's going to be a different storm from what we generally get around these waters the black clouds soon obscured the sun and the wind began to blow stronger than ever sending the white caps rolling over the ocean and causing the spray to fly over the deck of the yacht nelly clutched tom by the arm oh tom what does this mean she asked in a trembling voice it means that we are going to have a storm that's all he answered as lightly as he could but but will it hurt us came from grace i don't think so put in sam but we may get wet unless we go into the cabin i vote the girls all go into the cabin said dick sam can go with them if he wants to tom you and i can stay on deck to look after the sails i'm going to do my duty on deck too came from sam promptly another rush of wind now sent the spray flying in all directions and to keep from being drenched the girls retired to the tiny cabin or rather cutty of which the old glory boasted 
i am sure it is going to be an awful storm said dora i wish we were safe on land once more oh dear do you think we'll go to the bottom asked nellie the boys won't let the yacht go down answered dora they are all good sailors and captain jerry must know all about handling this craft but we may have a very bad time of it before we get back to santa barbara it was dark in the cabin but the yacht pitched and plunged so violently that they were afraid to light the lantern so they huddled together each holding another's hand on deck captain jerry gave orders to lower the topsail and haul in the jib several reefs were also taken in the mainsail and the boys stood ready to bring down the rest of the sheet with a rush at the first word from the old sailor it's a remarkable storm remarkable said captain jerry chewing vigorously on the quid of tobacco in his cheek ain't never seen no such storm here afore puts me in mind of a blow i stood out in once off the coast of alaska when i was in a whaler that storm caught us same time as this and ripped our mast out in a jiffy and drowned two of the sailors i hope nothing like that happens to us said dick with a shudder he was not thinking of himself but of the three girls in the cabin well lad it ain't going to be no easy blow i can tell you that replied captain jerry soon the wind began to whistle shrilly through the air and the sky became so black they could scarcely see a hundred yards in any direction then came some distant flashes of lightning and rolling thunder and soon the patter of rain now we are going to catch it said tom and he was right ten minutes later it was pouring in torrents and the rain continued to keep coming down as if there was to be no end of it boys aren't you most drowned asked nellie peeping out of the cabin door no but you'll be if you come out here called back tom we can't stand up and we can't sit still came from grace sorry but you'll have to make the best of it answered sam oh we won't mind if only we reach shore in safety put in dora and then the door was closed again on and on swept the old glory through the wind the rain and the darkness as there was no land near captain jerry paid his whole attention to making the yacht ride easily an almost impossible task in such a sea as was now raging suddenly from somewhere out of the air came a humming sound it grew louder and louder and the boys felt a strange suction of wind which made them hold tightly to the rail for fear of being pulled overboard by some uncanny force there followed a loud snap and a crash and the mast began to come down look out for the mast screamed captain jerry and all jumped just in the nick of time down came the stick to strike the rail and shatter it like a pipe stem and then lay over the deck and over the waves beyond End of chapter five chapter six of the rover boys on land and sea by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter six adrift on the pacific ocean the mast has gone by the board screamed dick on rising to his feet that stick will turn the yacht over gasped tom poor sam could not speak for a wave had struck him full in the mouth and he had all he could do to keep from being washed overboard the girls in the cabin heard the crash above the roaring of the elements and let up a scream of alarm are we going down shall we come out on deck stay where you are shouted back captain jerry clinging to the wheel with a grip of steel then he turned to dick can you get an axe and clear away the wreck i'll try it replied the eldest rover and he moved cautiously to where an axe rested in a holder soon he had the article in hand and was chopping away as fast as he could while tom holding to the bottom of the mast with one hand held dick with the other sam in the meantime cut away some cordage with a hatchet which was handy it was truly a perilous moment and it looked as if the mighty waves would swamp the old glory before the wreckage could be cleared away the girls stood at a cabin window watching them work and ready to leap out if the yacht should start to go down there it goes cried dick at last 
and gave another stroke with the axe there followed a snap and a crack and overboard slid the broken mast carrying a mass of cordage with it at once the old glory righted herself sending a small sheet of water flowing from one side of the deck to the other some of the water swept into the cabin and the girls were alarmed more than ever a good job that it's overboard said captain jerry another plunge or two and we would have gone over sure pop with the wreckage cleared away the boys breathed more freely but the peril was still extreme for it was no easy matter to keep the craft from taking the mighty waves broadside but the force of the wind drove them on and captain jerry handled the wheel as only a veteran tar could i guess it's a hurricane was tom's comment looks more like a cyclone to me spluttered sam i'd give a good deal to be out of it to keep from being swamped they had to run out to sea this was no pleasant prospect to the boys but it could not be helped we needn't tell the girls said dick it will only worry them more without doing any good two hours went by and the storm kept on as madly as ever night was now coming on and soon it was impossible to see a hundred feet in any direction the yacht's lanterns were lit and one was hoisted on a stick which dick nailed to the stump of the mast we've got to have some sort of light said captain jerry if not we may run afoul of some other craft the time went by slowly each hour seeming an age nobody felt like eating and nothing was said about supper until nearly nine o'clock when dora opened the cabin door and called dick we thought we would get to shore before eating she said how much longer will we be out do you think there is no telling dora he replied evasively no telling doesn't captain jerry know where we are hardly you see it is so dark and we can't make any headway with the mast gone how stupid of me i should have known that shall we try to fix up some supper you might pass some sandwiches but no we had better come down one at a time returned dick this suggestion was carried out captain jerry being the last to go down leaving the wheel in the hands of dick and tom don't ye let it get away from ye was his caution if ye do it will be good-bye liza jane and all of us goin slam bang to davy jones locker from old jerry the girls learned that they would probably have to remain on the yacht all night don't ye get alarmed he said the storm's goin down and we'll come out all right when the sun rises the prospect of remaining on the ocean all night was dismaying and all of the girls wondered what mrs stanhope would say when they did not return i know mother will be very much worried said dora soberly it was decided by the boys that they should take turns at lying down each being given two hours in which to rest sam was the first to turn in but it is doubtful if he slept to any extent tom followed and then came dick captain jerry declined stating he could sleep when he had this party safe on shore once more by morning the storm had taken another turn it no longer rained but the sky was murky and there was a dense fog which the wind blew first in one direction and then another they were still running to sea with small prospect of being able to turn back this is certainly more than i bargained for observed dick to tom in a low voice to me it looks mighty serious oh the storm is bound to go down yes tom but how long do you suppose the provisions and water will last at this question tom's face fell i hadn't thought of that dick i don't suppose we have more than enough for to-day have we well we might make it last two days on a pinch you brought quite a lot along but after that do you think we'll have to stay out here more than two days demanded sam i don't know what to think sam can't we rig up some sort of a jury mast captain jerry mentioned that we'll try there was no stick on board of the old glory outside of the bowsprit and at last they decided to saw this off and put it up as a small mast the task was no easy one and just as the temporary mast was being fitted into place there came an extra heavy puff of wind which sent the yacht far over on her side hold fast all of ye roared captain jerry and they obeyed and the stick went rolling over the side and out of sight in the billows god gasped tom that ends putting up another mast 
slowly the day wore along the girls were silent and if the truth be told more than one tear was shed between them although before the boys they tried to put on a brave face there were no regular meals and by the advice of captain jerry and dick they were sparing of the provisions and the water our only hope now is for the storm to go down or else to sight some passing ship said dick getting back to santa barbara at present is out of the question for all we know we may be a hundred or two hundred miles from the coast about two o'clock in the afternoon the sky cleared a little but as the fog lifted the wind blew with greater force sending them reeling and plunging into the mighty waves it looks as if we should be swamped after all said tom dolefully never say die tom came from sam resolutely i suppose mrs stanhope will be worried half to death no doubt of it nobody had any heart to talk and each watched eagerly for some sign of a sail tom had a spyglass and just before sunset he let out a shout a ship a ship where came from the others off in that direction and tom pointed with his hand all took a look through the glass and saw that he was right there was a steamer approaching if only they see us said dick and his brothers nodded the girls had heard the cry and now came on deck to learn what it meant oh i hope they take us on board and back home said nellie i must say i am heartily tired of this yacht the wind was increasing and the girls had to go back to the cabin to keep from getting wet the boys put up a flag upside down on a piece of planking and waited eagerly for the steamer to come nearer the yacht is settling cried dick a little while later don't you notice it the old glory has sprung some leaks responded captain jerry sadly take the wheel while i go and look them over tom and sam took the wheel while old jerry and dick inspected the leaks they soon reported that two seams had opened at the bow and that there was a bad break at the stern which was bound soon to interfere with the rudder i believe that steamer is going to leave us cried sam a little while later oh don't say that said dick we must signal her somehow we'll fire some rockets said captain jerry this was done and a little later they saw that the steamer was heading in their direction by this time the old glory showed unmistakable signs of being on the point of foundering and the girls were told to come on deck everybody was given a life preserver which had been kept close at hand since the beginning of the trouble we are seen cried sam joyously as a signal came from the steamer gradually the strange vessel drew closer and they saw that she was a rather clumsy affair of the tramp pattern used to carry all sorts of cargoes from one port to another they are lowering a small boat said sam a little later i wish they would hurry returned tom in a low voice i believe this yacht is going to go down very soon at last the small boat was close enough to be hailed and preparations were made for transferring the girls first it was no easy matter to make the change and it took a good quarter of an hour to land the girls on the steamer's deck by this time the old glory was completely waterlogged we have got to jump for it lads cried captain jerry unless you want to go down with her and jumped they did into the mighty waves and none too soon for a minute later the yacht went down out of their sight forever the small boat was not far away and soon sam and tom were picked up to get dick and captain jerry was not so easy but the task was finally accomplished and soon all of our friends stood on the deck of the tramp steamer safe and sound once more End of chapter six chapter seven of the rover boys on land and sea by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard chapter seven dismaying news thank fortune we got away from the yacht just in time exclaimed tom as he shook the water from his clothes i'm sorry to see the old glory go said captain jerry sadly i thought a heap of that craft i did it would be sorry news to take back to master bob never mind we'll help pay for the loss put in deck where are you folks from questioned the captain of the steamer as he came up to the crowd we came from santa barbara the storm took our mast and blew us out to sea answered dick 
we owe you something for picking us up you're welcome for what i've done answered captain farley come with me and i'll try to get you some dry clothing i can trick out the men folks and the young ladies will have to see my wife who happens to be who happens to be with me on this trip what steamer is this asked tom the tacoma lad are you bound for san francisco questioned sam no we are bound for honolulu on hawaiian islands honolulu burst out the others do you mean to say that the first port you will make will be honolulu demanded dick that's my orders lad i must get there just as quick as i can too for a cargo of sugar but we don't want to go to the hawaiian islands put in dora mercy it's two thousand miles away at this captain farley shrugged his broad shoulders i am sorry for you but i can't put back miss perhaps we'll meet some vessel bound for some port in the united states if so i can ask the captain to take you back and if you don't meet any vessel came from grace oh i think we'll pass some vessel returned the captain he took the girls and introduced them to his wife and then turned the boys and old jerry over to the first mate who obtained for them some dry clothing after this all were provided with a hot supper which did much toward making them comfortable at least physically speaking but not one of them was comfortable mentally to be carried to the hawaiian islands two thousand miles away was no pleasant thought besides what would their folks think of their prolonged absence mother will think that we have all been drowned said dora and that is what our folks will think too said nellie oh it is terrible simply terrible and she wrung her little hands by making inquiries dick learned that the steamer was expected to reach honolulu inside of two weeks if the weather was not too bad from honolulu they could get passage to san francisco on the mail steamer the trip lasting exactly seven days we'll have to get some money first said tom and we can't cable for it either he went on for the cable to the hawaiian islands from the united states had not yet been laid let us hope that we will see some ship that will take us back said sam day after day they watched eagerly for a passing sail but though they sighted four vessels and hailed them not one was bound for the united states outside of a whaler and that craft intended to stay out at least three months longer before making for port we are booked for this trip and no mistake sighed tom well since that is so let us make the best of it the tacoma was heavily laden and though the storm cleared away and the pacific ocean became moderately calm she made but slow progress our boilers are not in the best condition said captain fairly i trust there is no danger of their blowing up returned dick not if we don't force them too much it had been arranged that the boys and girls should pay a fair price for the trip to honolulu the money to be sent to the captain of the tacoma later on as for old jerry he signed articles to work his passage to the hawaiian islands and back again as captain fairley was rather short of hands he was glad to have the old sailor join his crew the days slipped by and having recovered from the effects of the storm the rover boys became as light-hearted as ever tom was particularly full of pranks no use of crying over spilt milk he declared let us be thankful the pitcher wasn't broken or in other words that we are not at this moment at the bottom of the pacific right you are replied sam there was an old piano on board and the boys and girls often amused themselves at this singing and playing as there were no other passengers they had the freedom of the ship this would be real jolly said tom if it wasn't that the folks at home must be worried and then he began to sing for he really could not be sad a life on the ocean wave a home on the rolling deep a house in a watery cave where i might rest and sleep did you ever hear such a song cried nelly and tom went on the boys stood on the burning deck munching apples by the peck the captain yelled he stood stock still for of those apples he wanted his fill tom rover burst out dora i believe you would sing at your own funeral and tom continued gaily sailing sailing over the bounding main for many a stormy wind shall blow ere the rovers get home again tom lives on songs said sam slyly he'd rather sing than eat a pie 
pie thundered tom tragically who said pie i haven't seen a home-made pie since since the time you went down in the pantry at midnight and ate two finished dick and then there was a burst of laughter never mind tom i'll make you half a dozen pies when we get home came from nellie will you really said tom and then he began once more as gaily as ever you can give me pudding and give me cake and anything else you care to bake but if you wish to charm my eye just hand me over some home-made pie that's all right said dick but in place of i you should have said stomach stomach doesn't rhyme with pie snorted tom i'm a true poet and i know what i am doing talking about pie makes me think of pie plates said sam let us play spinning the plate on deck it will be lots of fun trying to catch the plate while it is spinning and the steamer is rolling good cried grace and ran to get a plate from the cook's galley soon they were playing merrily and the game served to make an hour pass pleasantly when the forfeits had to be redeemed the girls made the boys do several ridiculous things tom had to hop from one end of the deck to the other on one foot sam had to stand on his head and recite mary had a little lamb and dick had to go to three of the sailors and ask each if they would tie the ship to a post during the night i'll wager you are a merry crowd on land said captain fairley as he paused to watch the fun takes me back to the time when i was a boy and he laughed heartily even the captain's wife was amused she was particularly fond of music and loved to listen to the playing and singing the days slipped by one after the other until captain fairley announced that forty-eight hours more ought to bring them in sight of diamond head a high hill at the entrance to honolulu harbor but another storm was at hand and that night the wind blew more fiercely than ever the tacoma tossed and pitched to such a degree that standing on the deck was next to impossible and all of the boys and the girls gathered in the cabin and held fast to the posts and the stationary seats it feels as if the steamer would bowl clear over said sam here we go again there was thunder and lightning and soon a deluge of rain fully as heavy as that experience while on board of the ill-fated old glory this continued all of the night and in the morning the storm seemed to grow worse instead of better we are in a run of bad luck said dick i really believe we will have all sorts of trouble before we get back to the united states toward noon a mist came up and it grew dark lanterns were lit and the tacoma felt her way along carefully for captain fairley knew that they were now in the track of considerable shipping by nightfall the steamer lay almost at a standstill for the mist was thicker than ever for safety the whistle was sounded at short intervals the girls were the first to retire and the boys followed half an hour later the staterooms of all were close together dick rover was the last to go to sleep how long he slept he did not know he awoke with a start a shock had thrown him to the floor of the stateroom and down came sam on top of him there were hoarse cries from the deck a shrill steam whistle and the sound of a foghorn and then a grinding thud and a bump that told the tacoma had either run into some other ship or into the rocks End of chapter 7chapter eight of the rover boys on land and sea by arthur m winfield this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Roy. chapter eight from one ship to another we struck something what is the matter are we going down these and a score of other cries rang out on board the steamer the thumping and bumping continued followed by a crashing that could mean but one thing that the ship was being splintered and that her seams were being laid wide open as soon as possible the rover boys slipped into some clothing and went on deck they were quickly followed by the three girls who clung tight to them in terror oh dick this is the worst yet came from dora what will be the end the tacoma is sinking was the cry from out of the darkness are we really sinking gasped nellie as she clutched tom yes we are came from sam can't you feel the deck settling they could only too plainly and in a minute more the water seemed to be running all around them 
the cries continued but it was so black they could see next to nothing what happened in the next few minutes the rover boys could scarcely tell afterward an effort was made to get out a lifeboat and it disappeared almost as soon as it left the side carrying some sailors with it then some red fire blazed up lighting up the tragic scene and revealing a schooner standing close by the steamer the sailing vessel had her bowsprit broken and part of her forward rail torn away if we must die let us die together said dick and they kept together as well as they could old jerry was with them and said he would do all he could for them he had already passed around life preservers and these they put on with all possible speed then followed a sudden plunge of the steamer and all found themselves in the waves of the ocean they went down together each holding the hand of somebody else when they came up tom was close to a lifeline thrown from the sailing vessel and this he clutched madly haul us in he yelled haul us in and the line was pulled in with care and after ten minutes of extreme peril the boys and the girls and captain jerry found themselves on board of the sailing vessel which proved to be a large three-masted schooner all of our friends were so exhausted that they had to be carried to the cabin and here dora and grace fainted away completely while nelly was little better off tom had had his left arm bruised and dick was suffering from an ugly scratch on the forehead it was fully an hour before any of them felt like moving around in the meantime the two vessels had separated and though red fire was burned twice after that and rockets sent up nothing more was seen or heard of the tacoma or those left on board but i don't think she went down said captain jerry she was too well built for that and he was right as events proved much crippled the steamer two days later entered honolulu harbor where she was laid up for repairs worn out completely by what they had passed through the boys slept heavily for the rest of the night not caring what ship they were on or where they were going everybody was busy with the wreckage so they were left almost entirely to themselves tom was the first to get up and going on deck found that the storm had cleared away and that the sun was shining brightly without delay he halted a sailor who happened to be passing what ship is this he questioned this ship the golden wave replied the sailor who was a norwegian and where are you bound the ship sailed for australia great scott australia gasped tom this is the worst yet what's up tom asked sam who had followed his brother this sailor tells me this ship is bound for australia why that is thousands of miles away i know it if we go to australia we'll never get back not quite as bad as that sam but we certainly don't want to go to australia who is the captain captain blossom replied the sailor where is he the sailor said he would take them to the captain and did so he proved to be a burly fellow with a rather sober-looking face got around at last eh he said eyeing tom and sam shrewdly we have and we must thank you for rescuing us replied tom that's all right one of your sailors tells me you were bound for australia put in sam he told you the truth won't you stop at some port in the hawaiian islands no but you might put us off can't spare the time as it is the storm blew me away out of my course answered captain blossom he had a twofold reason for not putting them ashore at or near honolulu it would not only take time but it might also lead to questioning concerning the fate of the steamer and he was afraid he would be hauled into some marine court for running into the tacoma for that was what he had done do you know anything about the steamer asked sam no she got away from us in the darkness after we hauled seven of you aboard the steamer lost some of her crew said tom shuddering did you lose any man one sailor and one of my passengers got hurt in the leg by the collision by this time dick joined the party followed by old jerry and the three girls will the captain carry us away to australia asked dora when the situation was explained i suppose so said dick soberly if i had some money i might buy him off but i haven't a dollar what little i did have i left on board of the tacoma the others were equally destitute and when captain blossom heard of this his face grew dark 
he was a close man and his first mate jack lesher was no better if you haven't any money you'll have to work your passage he growled i can't afford to carry you to australia for nothing then let us off at some port in the hawaiian islands said tom can't do it i told you retorted captain blossom angrily and you'll either work while you are on board or starve my what a tartar whispered sam well we'll work said dick but you must not force the young ladies to do anything i'm a sailor and will do my full share said old jerry but he did not like the situation any better than did the rovers the matter was talked over and seeing that they were willing to work captain blossom became a little milder in his manner he said he would give the three girls one of the staterooms but the boys and old jerry would have to join the crew in the forecastle fortunately the sailors on board the golden wave were a fairly clean lot so the forecastle was not so dirty a place as it might otherwise have been the boys did not like to be separated from the girls however and dick called the girls aside to talk the matter over i want to know if anything goes wrong said he if there is the least thing out of the way let us know at once and the girls promised to keep their eyes open once in the forecastle the boys were given three rough suits of clothes to wear while working then they were called out to work without delay for the storm had left much to do on board the golden wave we have only one passenger said one of the sailors in reply to a question from tom he is a young fellow named robert brown he was hurt during the storm but i reckon he's all right now tom was set to coiling some rope and sam and dick had to scrub down the deck this was by no means an agreeable task but nobody complained we must take what comes said dick cheerfully so long as we get enough to eat and are not abused i shan't say a word the boys had been to work about an hour when sam saw a young fellow limping around the other end of the deck there was something strangely familiar about the party and the youngest rover drew closer to get a better look at him dan baxter he cried in astonishment dan baxter at this cry the person turned and his lower jaw dropped in equal astonishment who or where did you come from he stammered so this is the vessel you shipped on went on sam and then he called out dick tom come here for a brief instant dan baxter's face was a study then a crafty look came into his eyes and he drew himself up excuse me but you have made a mistake in your man he said coldly what's that came from sam in bewilderment i am not the party you just named my name is robert brown is it came from the youngest rover if that is so you look exactly like somebody i know well by this time dick and tom came hurrying to the spot followed by dora who happened to be on deck dan baxter came from tom and dick simultaneously he says he isn't dan baxter said sam isn't dan baxter why baxter you fraud what new wrinkle is this said dick catching him by the arm let go of me came fiercely from baxter let go i say or it will be the worse for you you have made a mistake no mistake about it put in tom he is dan baxter beyond a doubt End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of The Rover Boys on Land and Sea by Arthur M. Winfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Gerard. Chapter Nine, in which the enemy is cornered. The loud talking had attracted the attention of Captain Blossom, and now the master of the Golden Wave strode up to the crowd. "What's going on here?" he demanded of the Rover Boys. "Why are you not at work as I ordered?" i have made an important discovery answered dick is this your passenger captain blossom he is what of him he is a thief and ran away from san francisco to escape the police it's a falsehood roared dan baxter they have made a mistake i am a respectable man just out of college and my father dr l z brown is a well-known physician of los angeles i am traveling to australia for my health his real name is daniel baxter and his father is now in prison said tom he robbed us of our money and some diamonds while we were stopping at a hotel in san francisco the detectives followed him up 
but he slipped them by taking passage on your ship i tell you my name is brown robert brown stormed baxter this is some plot hatched up against me who are these fellows anyway he went on turning to the captain they came from the steamer we ran into answered captain blossom i never saw them before at this moment dora touched the captain on the shoulder please captain she said i knew dan baxter quite well and i am sure this young man is the same person it ain't so i tell you captain it is a plot what kind of plot could it be asked captain blossom he scarcely knew what to say i don't know perhaps they want to get hold of my money went on baxter struck by a sudden idea that's right we do want to get hold of the money cried sam for it belongs to us at least two hundred and seventy-five dollars of it not counting what he may have got on the diamonds and the cuff buttons you shan't touch my money screamed baxter captain he ought to be placed under arrest said dick dora had gone back to the cabin and now she returned in great haste with nellie and grace to be sure that is dan baxter said nellie there can be no mistake put in grace we all know him only too well you see captain blossom that we are six to one said tom and you will surely believe the ladies how is you all happen to know him so well demanded the captain curiously we know him because we all went to school together answered dick these young ladies lived in the vicinity of the school we had trouble with baxter at school and later on out west and ever since that time he has been trying to injure us we met him in san francisco in the hotel lobby and at night he went to our room cut open a travelling bag and unlocked our trunks and robbed us of two hundred and seventy five dollars in cash some diamond studs a pair of cuff buttons and some clothing i've got an idea almost shouted sam maybe he has some of the stolen stuff in his stateroom yes yes let us search the stateroom by all means exclaimed tom you shall not touch my room howled baxter turning pale i have nothing there but my own private property if that is so you shouldn't object to having the stateroom searched observed captain blossom if we get back our money we may be able to pay you something captain for our passage said dick this was a forceful argument and set captain blossom to thinking he was a man who loved money dearly i will go along and we will look around the stateroom he said after a pause this is an outrage cried dan baxter i will have the law on you for it shut up i am master of my own ship retorted captain blossom and led the way to the stateroom dan baxter occupied the door was locked and baxter refused to give up the key but the captain had a duplicate and soon he and the rover boys were inside the room baxter followed them still expostulating but in vain here is a pocketbook full of bills cried tom bringing the article to light here is my light overcoat came from dick see it has my initials embroidered in the hanger aunt martha did that for me here are my gold cuff buttons exclaimed sam they were a present from my father and they have my monogram engraved on each and he showed the articles to the captain i reckon it's a pretty clear case against you said captain blossom turning to dan baxter here are half a dozen letters said tom holding them up you can see they are all addressed to daniel baxter that's his name and he'd be a fool to deny it any longer well i won't deny it cried the big bully what would be the use you were all against me even the captain i am not against you retorted captain blossom but if you are a thief i want to know it why did you give me your name as robert brown that's my business baxter paused for a moment now you have found me out what are you going to do about it he went on brazenly you can't arrest me on shipboard no but we can have you arrested when we land said dick and in the meantime we will take charge of what is our own here are some pawn tickets for the diamonds said sam who was continuing the search they show he got seventy five dollars on them we will keep the tickets and the seventy five dollars too if we can find the money said tom but the money could not be found for the greater part had been turned over to captain blossom for baxter's passage to australia and the rest spent before leaving shore the pocketbook contained only two hundred and thirty dollars 
what did he pay you for the passage questioned dick of the captain one hundred dollars then you ought to turn that amount over to our credit why what do you mean i mean that dan baxter has no right to a free passage on your ship since he bought the passage with our money let him work his way and place that passage money to our credit that's the way to talk put in tom make him work by all means he deserves good hard labor came from sam i don't think you can make me work burst out dan baxter i am a passenger and i demand that i be treated as such you're an impostor returned captain blossom bluntly the fact that you used an assumed name proves it if i wanted to do so i could clap you in the ship's brig until we reach port and chain you into the bargain i want no thieves on board my ship here is more of our clothing came from tom pick out all the things that are yours said the captain and take the other things that are yours too this was done nobody paying any attention to baxter's protests when the rovers had what there was of their things the captain turned to the bully i've made up my mind about you he said speaking with great deliberation i am master here and a judge and jury into the bargain you can take your choice either sign articles as a foremast hand for the balance of the trip or be locked up as a prisoner on prison rations do you mean that gasped baxter turning pale i do but the passage money goes to the credit of these young fellows it's an outrage no it's simply justice to my way of thinking i'll give you until tomorrow to make up your mind what you will do this ended the talk with dan baxter the captain said he wanted to see the rover boys in the cabin and they followed him to that place captain i feel i must thank you for your fair way of managing this affair said dick feeling that a few good words at this point would not go amiss i hope you treat baxter as he deserves i will try to do right was captain blossom's answer but what i want to know now is what do you intend to do with that money it seems to me i should be paid something for keeping you on board i have a proposition to make captain we will give you two hundred dollars if you will allow us to consider ourselves passengers and by us i mean the young ladies as well as ourselves it's not very much if we pay you that amount it will leave us but thirty dollars hardly enough with which to cable home for more of course when we get our money in australia we will pay you whatever balances do you and something besides for saving us this pleased captain blossom and he said he would accept the offer the matter was discussed for half an hour and it was decided that the boys should have two staterooms the one occupied by baxter and another next to that given over to the girls when dora nelly and grace heard of the new arrangement that had been made they were highly pleased i didn't want to see you do the work of a common sailor said dora to dick oh it wouldn't kill me he returned lightly even as it is i'll give a hand if it is necessary it's a wonder captain blossom took to your offer so quickly he loves money that's why dora he would rather have that two hundred dollars than our services and with this remark dick hit the nail squarely on the head End of chapter nine chapter ten of the rover boys on land and sea by arthur m winfield this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter ten a blow in the darkness it would be hard to describe dan baxter's feelings after captain blossom and the rover boys left him alone in his stateroom at one instant he was fairly shaking with rage and at the next quaking with fear over what the future might hold in store for him they have got the best of me again he muttered clenching his fists and after i felt sure i had escaped them it must have been fate that made captain blossom pick them up now i've either got to work as a common sailor or submit to being locked up in some dark foul-smelling hole on the ship and when we get to australia unless i watch my chance to skip out they'll turn me over to the police he could not sleep that night for thinking over the situation and was up and dressed before daylight 
strolling on deck he came face to face with sam who had come up to get the morning air i suppose you think you have got the best of me growled baxter it looks like it doesn't it returned sam briefly the game isn't ended yet no but it will be when you land in prison baxter i'll get square you have promised to get square times without number and you have failed every time i won't fail the next time yes you will wrong never yet triumphed over right oh don't preach sam rover i am not preaching i am simply trying to show you how foolish it is to do wrong why don't you turn over a new leaf oh such talk makes me sick growled the bully and turned away a little while later captain blossom appeared and hunted up dan baxter who sat in his stateroom packing up his few belongings well have you decided on your course young man demanded the master of the golden wave do you mean to lock me up if i refuse to become a sailor asked dan baxter i do and i won't argue with you either is it yes or no i don't want to be locked up in some dark hole on your ship then you are willing to become a sailor i i suppose so very well you can remove your things to the forecastle jack lesher the first mate will give you your bunk this was adding insult to injury as it is termed so far as baxter was concerned for it will be remembered that it was jack lesher who had obtained the passage on the golden wave for the bully but dan baxter was given no chance to demur taking his traps he went on deck where jack lesher met him grinning in sickly fashion so you are going to make a change eh said the mate you needn't laugh at me if i am growled baxter i shan't laugh my boy it's hard luck said lesher come along he led the way to the forecastle and gave baxter a bunk next to that occupied by old jerry then he brought out an old suit of sailor's clothing and tossed it over you've run in hard luck boy he said in a low voice after he had made certain that nobody else was within hearing i am sorry for you really queried dan baxter giving the mate a sharp look yes i am and if i can do anything to make it easy for you count on me went on jack lesher thank you i suppose taking that money and the other things was more of a boy's sport than anything eh that's the truth i wanted to get square with those rover boys they are my bitter enemies i didn't want the money just then old jerry came in and the conversation came to an end but baxter felt that he had a friend on board and this eased him a little he did not know that the reason jack lesher liked him was because the first mate was a criminal himself and had once served a term in a michigan jail for knocking down a passenger on a boat and robbing him of his pocket-book as the old saying goes birds of a feather flock together when the girls came on deck they found baxter doing some of the work which dick and tom had been doing the morning before at first they were inclined to laugh but dora stopped herself and her cousins don't let us laugh at him she whispered it is hard enough for the poor fellow as it is i am not going to notice him after this said nelly to me he shall be an entire stranger and the others agreed to treat dan baxter in the same manner but the boys were not so considerate and tom laughed outright when he caught sight of baxter swabbing up some dirt on the rear deck this made the bully's passion arise on the instant and he caught up his bucket as if to throw it at tom's head don't you dare baxter cried tom if you do we'll have a red-hot war i can lick you tom rover perhaps you can and perhaps you can't baxter put up his fists but on the approach of dick and sam he promptly retreated but before he went he hissed in tom's ear you wait and see what i do he had better keep his distance said dick if he doesn't somebody will get hurt i suppose it galls him to work said sam he always was rather lazy the day proved a nice one and the rover boys spent most of the time with the three girls who were glad of their company once more all speculated on the question of what had become of the tacoma and of what the folks at home would think concerning their prolonged absence i'll give a good deal to send a message home said dick we must cable as soon as we reach shore added dora 
they saw but little of dan baxter during the day and nothing whatever of him the day following he is trying to avoid us said sam well i am just as well satisfied through old jerry they learned that baxter hated the work given to him and that he was being favored a little by the first mate tell you what i hate that mate said jerry he's got a wicked eye and he drinks like a fish i know he drinks answered tom i smelt the liquor in his breath they were now getting down into warmer latitudes and the next night proved unusually hot it was dark with no stars shining and the air was close as if another storm was at hand i can't sleep said tom after rolling around in his berth for half an hour i'm going on deck and he dressed himself and went up for some air he walked forward and leaned over the rail watching the waves as they slipped behind the noble ship tom's coming on deck had been noticed by dan baxter who sat on the side of the forecastle meditating his troubles as the bully saw the youth leaning over the rail his face took on a look of bitter hatred i'll teach him to laugh at me he muttered gazing around he saw that nobody was within sight and then he arose to his feet with a cat-like tread he came up behind tom who still looked at the waves totally unconscious of danger baxter's heart beat so loudly that he was afraid tom would hear it again he looked around not a soul was near and the gloom of the night was growing thicker he'll laugh another way soon he muttered and stepped closer his fist was raised to deliver a blow when tom happened to straighten up and look around he saw the form behind him and the upraised arm and leapt aside the blow missed its mark and tom caught baxter by the shoulder what do you mean dan baxter by this attack he began when the bully aimed another blow at him this struck tom full in the temple and partly dazed him then the two clenched all fell heavily against the rail i'll fix you panted baxter striking another blow as best he could and then as tom struck him in return he forced tom's head against the rail with a thump the blow made tom see stars and he was more dazed than ever let up he gasped but baxter continued to crowd him against the rail which at this point was very weak because of the collision with the steamer suddenly there was a snap and a crack and the rail gave way baxter leapt back in time to save himself from falling but tom could not help himself and with a wild cry he went overboard End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of The Rover Boys on Land and Sea by Arthur M. Winfield. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Chapter Eleven A Call from the Stern. For the instant after Tom slipped over the side of the golden wave, Dan Baxter was too dazed to do more than stare at the spot where he had last seen the boy with whom he had been struggling. God, he muttered presently, God he repeated and crouched back in the darkness the great beads of perspiration came to his brow as he heard rapid footsteps approaching would he be accused of sending tom rover to his death what's the trouble came in the voice of captain blossom instead of answering dan baxter crept still further back then watching his chance he darted into the forecastle hello the rail is broken he heard the captain exclaim bring a lantern here quick a sailor came running with a lantern which lit up the narrow circle of the deck near the rail and part of the sea beyond somebody gave a cry said the captain to those who began to gather looks to me as if the rail gave way and let somebody overboard tom rover was on deck came from old jerry do you reckon as how it was him i don't know it was somebody that's certain call all hands at once this was done and dan baxter had to come out with the rest he was pale and trembled so he could scarcely stand all here said captain blossom must have been one of the rover boys or one of the young ladies word was passed along and soon sam and dick came rushing on deck tom is missing cried sam if that is so i am afraid boys you have seen the last of your brother said captain blossom he turned to his crew do any of you know anything of this affair there was a dead silence then he questioned the man at the wheel 
don't know a thing cap'n was the answer it's queer he must have pressed on the rail very hard here are half a dozen nails torn from the wood while this talk was going on dick and sam had passed along the rail from the place of the accident to the stern perhaps he caught hold somewhere said sam who was unwilling to believe that his brother had really perished they had just gained the stern and were looking over when a call came from out of the darkness help 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 it's tom screamed dick in delight tom is that you yes help where are you holding on to a rope help me quick i i can't hold on much much longer we'll help you answered dick captain blossom was called and more lanterns were lit and then a bengal light and tom was seen to be holding fast to a rope which had in some manner fallen overboard and become entangled in the rudder chain by the aid of the boat hook the rope was hauled up and to the side of the golden wave at the same time the sails were lowered and then a rope ladder was thrown down dick descended to the edge of the waves and watching his chance caught tom by the collar of his coat then the brothers came slowly to the deck a cheer went up when it was found that tom was safe once more and nelly laning could not resist rushing forward and catching the wet youth in her arms tom was so exhausted he dropped on the nearest seat and it was several minutes before he had recovered strength enough to speak i would have been drowned had it not been for that rope he said when questioned as i slid along the side of the ship the rope hit me in the face i clutched it and clung fast for dear life then when i came up and swept astern i called as loudly as i could but it seemed an age before anybody heard me it was a narrow escape said dick you can thank a kind providence that your life was spared you must have leaned on the rail awfully hard put in nelly leaned on the rail repeated tom it wasn't my fault that i went overboard it was dan baxter's dan baxter came from several exactly he tackled me in the dark and we had it hot and heavy for a minute then he crowded me on the rail and it gave way he jumped back and let me go overboard the rascal i'll settle with him cried dick i'll teach him to keep his distance after this he knew baxter was still forward and ran in that direction the bully saw him coming and tried to hide in the forecastle but dick was too quick for him and hauled him back on the deck take that for shoving my brother overboard you scoundrel he exclaimed and hit baxter a staggering blow straight between the eyes stop roared the bully and struck out in return but dick dodged the blow and then hit baxter in the chin and on the nose the elder rover boy was excited and hit with all of his force and the bully measured his length on the deck good for you cried old jerry who stood looking on that's the way to serve him the sarpent slowly baxter arose to his knees and then his feet where he stood glaring at dick don't you hit me again he muttered but i will retorted dick and struck out once more this time his fist landed on the bully's left eye and once again baxter went down this time with a thud the sailors were collecting and soon jack lesher rushed up he stepped between dick and the bully stop it he ordered harshly but don't allow fighting on board of this craft i wasn't fighting answered dick coolly i was just teaching a rascal a lesson it amounts to the same thing if you have any fault to find tell the captain or tell me well i'll go to the captain not you retorted dick all right growled the first mate but just remember you can't boss things when i'm around when captain blossom understood the situation he was thoroughly angry baxter certainly ought to be in prison he said i'll clap him in the brig and feed him on bread and water for three days and see how he likes that he ought not to be left at large said dora with a shudder he may try to murder somebody next we'll watch him after this said the captain he kept his word about putting baxter in the ship's jail but through lesher the buddy he got much better fare than bread and water strange as it may seem a warm friendship sprang up between the bully and the first mate i ain't got nothing against you baxter said jack lesher when we get to australia perhaps we can work together eh and he closed one eye suggestively 
baxter had told him of his rich relative and the mate thought there might be a chance to get money from baxter he'd rather give me money than have me tell his relation what sort of a duck he is said lesher to himself after this incident the time passed pleasantly enough for over a week when baxter came from the brig he went to work without a word whenever he passed the rovers or the girls he acted as if he did not know they were there and they ignored him just as thoroughly but the boys watched every move the bully made as mentioned before jack lesher was a drinking man and as the weather grew warmer the mate increased his potions until there was scarcely a day when he was thoroughly sober captain blossom remonstrated with him but this did little good i'm attending to my duties said lesher and if i do that you can't expect more from me i thought i hired a man that was sober said captain blossom i won't place my vessel in charge of a man who gets drunk yet he was not willing to do the mate's work and put that work on to others so jack lesher had to take his turn on deck no matter in what condition i must say i don't like that first mate at all said tom to sam he is very friendly with baxter i have noticed that replied the youngest rover such a friendship doesn't count in the mate's favor last night he was thoroughly drunk and wasn't fit to command well that is captain blossom's lookout the captain can't be on deck all of the time two nights after this talk jack lesher was again in command of the ship captain blossom having retired after an unusually hard day it was hot and dark and the air betokened a storm the man at the wheel was following a course set by the captain and the sailors whose watch was on deck lay around taking it as easy as they could the mate had been drinking but little in the afternoon but before coming on deck he took several drops of rum he was in a particularly bad humor and ready to find fault with anybody or anything some of the sails had been reefed and these he ordered shaken out although there was a stiff breeze blowing then he approached the man at the wheel and asked for the course southwest by south was the answer that ain't right growled the mate it should be south by west the captain gave it to me southwest by south answered the man don't talk back to me roared jack lesher i know the course as well as the captain make us south by west or i'll flog you for disobeying orders ay ay sir answered the man at the wheel and the course was changed for the sailors stood greatly in fear of the mate then the mate sent below for another drink of rum End of chapter eleven